Hello, my name is Marcus Mark and welcome to Extraordinary, a new podcast series where I interview ordinary people with extraordinary outlooks on life. Part of this series will also include B-sides with my friend, Ed Stoppard, the actor, where we will be interviewing the odd celebrity, actor, musician, person of note, politician, whoever Ed can get, about their hidden passion that people might not know about. First up for my debut podcast is Martin Law. I first came across Martin when he first reached out to me on Twitter as he runs his own podcast series interviewing filmmakers. And then a little later, he invited me up to Berry to speak to his students. He is a film media studies teacher, but he also has aspirations to be a filmmaker. And we talked about how we as artists can combine a full-time day job with our passion. Anyway, I really hope you enjoy this podcast series. I'm really interested in doing this series of podcasts and I want to do it with people that I've met and I've had some kind of interaction with. I really enjoyed your company that day when I came to teach the kids. Why don't we start with your story? Where where are you from and what did you study? What did you want to be? So I'm... I'm from Preston in Lancashire, and since I was about 15, maybe, I've, I've, I've known I wanted to get into film. I, I love films. The more research I did when I was at, at sixth form myself, I kind of started to think, well, you don't really need to go to, like, a film school or study it any further. You know, it's all about what you kind of know already. But then on results day for those A-levels, I, I had nothing else lined up at all. I didn't know what I was going to do. So I, I ended up enrolling at the the university, which is in Preston, which is the University of Central Lancashire. And I did a combined honours degree. So it was film and TV screenwriting and film production. So it kind of covered both things that I was interested in, you know, writing and directing. How long ago was this course? So I'm now 30. I'll be 31 at the end of June. So this was 2007 to 2010. So I did finish it. I did the three years, but the course itself, I mean, I... You know, I'm not going to name and shame and, and anything, but it, it really didn't do anything for me at all. And, and in many ways, it was a bit of a, a bit of the opposite in that it demotivated me in a way. I didn't, I didn't kind of click with any of the tutors. I didn't really feel that they knew a lot and really opened any doors. So from that point of view, that was a bit of a waste of time. Other than kind of getting the piece of paper at the end of it, which you know a lot of more traditional degrees are as well. Do you think, do you think that that experience, I'm now jumping forward 10 years to now, do you think that disappointing experience of education is what I believe makes you a wonderful teacher to your students today? One million percent. I mean, obviously, obviously, you know, I'm I'm cringing a bit when you're saying this, so I, I appreciate it, but I mean, I'm not sure I agree, but but no, I, I um, yeah, I agree with uh, that that statement. That yes, in terms of being a reflective practitioner, which teachers all have to be, I studied um, on the PGC, the teacher training course. We look at reflection, and there was a guy called Brookfield, and he had these four lenses. So when you reflect and you look through these different lenses, and one of them is the autobiographical lens, where you literally reflect on your own experiences when you've been a student. So of course, when I look back at my time. At university, I think, yeah, this is what I would have liked to have done on the course. And this is what kind of interaction I would have liked with the tutor. So, of course, that's what I'm trying to do now. Yeah, one million percent. And also, when we met in Berry and I gave a talk to your students, which was a really wonderful experience for me, we briefly talked about a quite a painful experience of trying to, invert commas, get into the industry uh, where you came to London and worked on a TV show. That story really stuck with me because it resonated with my own experiences. And many people who I talk to uh, have an experience such as that, which is kind of a quite a harsh negative experience of the TV and film industry. Do you think that experience also has shaped you as a as a teacher today? So I had a few kind of freelance contracts 
on a few different TV shows, Sunday Morning Live, a few others. And to be honest, yeah, I was just not having good experiences, you know. I mean, I don't really want to get into the full thing, but I did work on the Jeremy Kyle show. Now, I was offered a six-month contract, and I left less than halfway through. And in a way, it was mutual consent because – um, and, and that's the thing, that sh- that particular show had such a high turnover of staff, it was unbelievable. The story that keeps coming back to me as an outsider coming in is just how toxic TV and film uh, productions are. The sets are toxic, the politics is toxic. And we don't have to go into the details of, of, of what happened. How do you as a teacher, because, you know, feed that back to your students. Many of these students are young. They're trying to get into this industry. How do you nurture and protect your students ahead of what you experienced? Do you do you do that at all? Yeah, of course. So, I mean, I am somebody that is an open book. I'm completely honest with, with everyone in everyday life anyway. But with my students, I'm happy to explain even down to wage, you know, what, what I was earning, which in reality, looking back, was a pittance, you know because I was a, as a, a researcher, you, you know, you are quite low down, but yeah, I, I was definitely open with them. And, and as you mentioned, did I get back into education because of my experiences in TV? 100% because I was never going to be able to change TV from being in TV or, you know, or film because I am just a tiny ant in the bigger picture. But I thought, well, at least if I can go back into education, teaching, then I can potentially influence other people going into that. Now, I guess they could still go into it and then be exposed to what it's really like and and then they have to adapt and be like that too. But I mean, I, yeah, I, I witnessed some quite shady behaviour with manipulating contributors, but also the way that we as staff were treated. You know, you're expected to work all hours under the sun for such little money. So I am honest with my students and say, this is what it's like. And as long as you are happy and you are aware of that, then then okay. And obviously I've got to be careful not to say anything in such a negative way. I'm not trying to put anyone off at all. See, I guess I was a little bit naive to think that that's how I would have been treated in the industry and, and how I experienced the industry. I, I guess I was expecting, you know, a lot, a lot better. We have, we, we, as this is the, for me, the, the big contradiction of the of TV and film and creative industries is the expectations, the gap between our expectations and the reality. Because we've been inspired by stories, haven't we? We were inspired by TV shows and we were inspired by film. They're the they are the engine of our inspiration. So when you get exposed to the reality, it's it is it, a bit of a is a bit of a come down. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, do you think that it was like this? 30 years ago 40 years ago or do you think it's kind of got worse i don't know because i don't know what it what the business was like and again i'm i'm speaking as a as a as you know because when we first met you wanted to interview me for a podcast about my experience as an independent filmmaker and my whole experience is is coming from the outside i think that's given me an advantage in some ways because i've not had to sort of play the game or pull the levers to get to a certain position. I'm, I am naive. I am. And maybe my naivety is my strength as well allowed me to believe I could self-distribute my own film. And I think when we spoke, you, you know, you went into detail about your experience in professional TV. And I, and I thought, well, this is what makes you a good teacher. And, and, and I think the point of this podcast that I'm trying to explore is that, is the things that don't work out for us are the things that make us. So maybe those negative experiences really did bring something to you as a teacher. How are the students that I met? How are they getting on? So lockdown, I do feel, has not been good for students, naturally. I mean, these are students who are 18, 19, 20 years old. I remember, you know, obviously I've discussed how when I was a student, I didn't have a great experience, but naturally I'm not as mature as I am now, you know, back then. So I'm not going to blame the tutors completely for me not doing much, you know, and, and being a great student back in 2010, because that's just, that just comes with age, doesn't it? So I think that my students are remind me actually of, of what I was like there back then. So slackers, you know, in terms of, in terms of, 
they'll do what they have to if they have to, but you know, the bare minimum. So at the moment I'm marking some work and, and the lockdown, as I said, it's not helped them because we're not there to kind of crack that whip a little bit, you know, and some students need that, some, some don't, but I think that my particular students would have benefited from a bit more face to face. Yeah. I, I think we go to college at the wrong age. I think it's an age thing. I, I, I went to film school quite late in life. I went uh, when I was 39. So yeah, but I, I, I just embraced it fully as a kind of mature student would do. I think when you're 19, 20, you're, you're still trying to understand the world and you're still trying to work your, out your place in it. At the age of 39, and maybe this is for all listeners, it's never too late to explore a new avenue. I went to film school and I loved every minute of it. Even the, even if it even if it wasn't working for me, even even if there were moments when I thought I completely disagree with this, and there were some you know heated discussions, even if I didn't agree with what was being said, at least in my mind I could work out why I didn't agree with it, and that was still valid and it was still useful for me in my journey, which never stops as educating myself as to why things work why certain stories work, why certain techniques are more effective than others. Um, So even a bad education can be a very worthwhile thing. I think it's just about your attitude at at that point in time. And I could see the the younger kids on the course, those who are 20, 21, who didn't respond in that way. If If the lesson didn't connect with them, then they would reject the whole lesson. Whereas when you're older, if the lesson isn't working for you, in terms of in terms of what you think, in terms of your mindset, you 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 are smart enough, and you have enough critical thinking to go. Okay, well, I understand that point of view, but this is what I think, and it it's almost acts as a kind of testing ground. It's, it's a testing ground for you. Uh, even a bad education can be a worthwhile experience. I agree one hundred percent that you know being told that at eighteen, you, you know, university is is where you, where you got to go. I mean. At the, at the college I'm teaching at now, I do still, I do teach on the level three as well. So I teach 16 year olds and 17 year olds. So again, I'm not afraid to tell these students that, you know, if you, if you don't feel ready to go to university, that's fine. Don't just apply for the sake of it. Like I did, because in a way it'll be a waste of time. And, and in a way you are judged based on the results you got and the films you might've made if you do a film production course back then. Whereas, you know, I, I'm, I'm not proud of any work I did back then because I, w- I wasn't in the right head frame that I am now. And what when we talked, we would talk passionately about your own desire to make films. Where it, where are you with that? I mean, this is a you know making films, telling stories is is a is a is a light from my point of view is a lifelong vocation that is a privilege. And uh, I have a full time job as well. I can't support myself just making independent films. Certainly, I can't support myself making short films. Where where are you at of your creative life? In a way, I, again, this is something that I'm a little embarrassed about because I've always kind of told people that, you know, I write scripts, I make films, but in reality, I've made two films in the last 10 years, two short films. So I, I, I do feel that I've probably procrastinated a lot. Now, I've this year, from, you know, from talking to people like yourself, from doing the podcast, I've done 10 interviews for the podcast and... I can honestly say I've learned more about making films and, and what to expect making films and, and all that kind of thing from doing those 10 interviews than I did on that three-year BA. So it has inspired me to get back into things. And I've been, I have been writing a script with a friend for years and we've kind of just, again, both gone separate ways and come back to it in little bits. So that's something that is a focus for me. And again, that's one of the reasons why I got in touch with Jonathan Sothcott for the first podcast I did. And then every other person I've interviewed, I have chosen them for different reasons. So for example, for yourself, I found you through a Stephen Follows article. I think I just Googled like breakdown of a, of a budget of a film. And it, and this was the best that you can find online of how a, a, a film's budget is broken down line by line. Because again, that is not something I was taught on my BA now proper film schools like you went to might be a lot better at that. no no 
That's not taught. It can't be taught. And the truth is, the only reason I was able to share that information was because I owned the movie. It was mine, 100%. I could do what I wanted with it. And therefore, because uh, I financed it myself, I distributed that film myself, it meant I owned the information that went with it. And therefore, when Stephen, who is you know, a remarkable person in himself and is probably somebody I'd like to get onto this podcast actually um asked me to share as much as I could I was like how much do you want and he said I want all of it I said I'll give you everything I've got the interesting thing about that article was the the head of the American film market which is one of the big film markets on the planet championed it as a document the thing that you came across and would regularly tell everybody at all the other festivals he was apparently running around Cannes going you've got to read this you've got to read this and it has that document has been read a lot because it is because there is nothing else like it because no one else is in a position as I was to reveal that information. Yeah, no, it, I mean it was definitely an eye opener for me, and obviously you know the budget was a lot higher than I'm ever gonna gonna achieve. But there was a interview on Twitter that I saw. So Britflix is another podcast which is really good, and I heard an interview with a, a young director called Jamie Noel who had made a a feature film for 15 grand. So again, I got in touch with him for the podcast because I wanted to ask kind of questions more focusing on how he physically made it and kind of breaking down costs. Now, what he did was literally pay all the actors the same kind of day rate. Now, obviously, that's going to hinder who you can get. You know, you're not going to be able to get um, Stephen Delane or or whoever. Well, Well, with someone like Stephen... He'll just do the project if he loves it. I mean, that there are actors out there that will that are have artistic integrity and are really doing it because they love it. And of course, they want the money as well. Who doesn't? The advice I always give to other aspiring independent filmmakers and filmmakers in general is if you can get that script uh, to the right hands, then you can make an emotional connection with that actor and it won't be about the money. And it certainly wasn't about the money, one Papadopoulos and Sons, for all of these actors, because we were in a sort of unique position where the script was being sort of handed around and people were saying, yeah, I want to be in it. And then there was a conversation about money. That never happens. And the conversation is often money first. You know, my learning curve since Papadopoulos and Sons was actually that was unique. In order to open a conversation, you need to go in with an offer. So I've spent the last 10 years trying to get scripts to actors. (laughs) <laughs> without their agents knowing in the hope that they will like what they read and they'll want to jump in with me. It's it's the curse of the independent filmmaker, but it's also something I'm you, you have to em- embrace as well. So, so if any independent filmmakers out there listening to this, that's a separate, whole separate subject. I mean, getting back to you and being a, a teacher that has aspirations to, to make a film what what is the joy for you in being a teacher in, in film? What is the, because you when know, I went, when, when I went to Berry, you seem like this bright spark of energy. I just don't, didn't feel that people appreciated just how much energy you were prepared to give to this. What, what is it that you want to truly do? Is it to make films or is it to become a great teacher? So, I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, you know, Mark Jenkin, who made Bait, he's a university lecturer. I'm not sure where it is. It's in Falmouth. And I know, Mark, we met at Deanard on the bus going from the airport to the hotel. Mark will hopefully listen to this because we follow each other on Twitter. And I met him before Mark won his BAFTA. He is a remarkable person. Um, and we exchanged a, a, a lot of stories in Deanard. But he, for me, and I would love to get Mark on this podcast, Mark, you're, you're, you're coming on this podcast. He is an incredible person because he is a great, great teacher. He is passionate like you are. And I think Mark's sort of my age, um, uh, sort of older. You're only, you're only a young man still. So he's an incredible model. And don't forget, he's won his BAFTA. Uh, I don't know exactly how old he is. Is he mid 40s? Late 40s, I don't know. So, like I said, I just, I don't know if I heard it in a podcast or read it somewhere, but he, like I said, he lectures and he, and he kind of was discussing how actually in, in the UK, and this actually goes back to what the first guy I interviewed, Jonathan Softcott, had said that actually there is no real film industry in the UK. 
in that you can't really have a full-time job. And it's like what you've said, you still have your regular job, you know, your regular business. So he, he lectures to essentially then support his filmmaking. So I guess, I guess that is something that I, I would want to do. And I think even if I, you know, I've got these aspirations to make this feature film, which I'm, I'm you know, hopefully going to be finished by next month. And I, I plan to shoot it really low budget through crowdfunding. And I obviously have high aspirations for it, but I'm, I'm you know, I'm fully aware that it's not going to change my life totally. You know, we're not exactly Hollywood. <laughs> You know. Hang on, hang on. You've you've struck something that's really important there. Whatever we do, we have to do it well with our passion. You know, I I run a business, and it, you're right, it pays the bills. But I, I am like you, passionate about the day job. Look, there is this false idea that you go into an industry. These people are right. There is no industry. It really is a coalition of individuals. Part of my attract, part of the attraction of independent film for me was that there was no industry, that actually you can pick up a camera like John Cassavetes and you can make your own film and it might take you three years to do, but it's your film and it's your exploration and it's your art. And that's a very different thing from being hired by a production company or a studio to go make a film for commercial exploitation. The joy and freedom of being an independent filmmaker or the joy and freedom of being an independent anything that it's actually you work at your own pace you explore your own ideas the danger for all of us is that we look at the industry and go we're not part of it we don't have big budgets and we get sucked into that sort of false game whereas the true liberation is is working with what you've got to create something that is 100% your own. So, you know, using Mark as an example is absolutely spot on. And there's nothing to stop you being a brilliant teacher and a brilliant filmmaker. And remember that you're only 30. So there, there are so much, so many different angles to look at. And, and that's why actually now with these, these students, this is the biggest thing that I'm trying to trying to teach them that you've got to be independent and you've got to be thinking outside of the box. How can you make something for virtually no money and get it seen? Because yes, you can make a film 15 grand, but if no one's going to see it and you, you know, you, you're forcing people to watch it yourself by just constantly sending out the links. It's not the same thing, is it? I hope, it, I hope you go away thinking, yeah, I can be a great teacher and I can make movies there. Not only are they not incompatible, they actually do fit together. I think for me, my next progression would be to get a, a, a lecturing job in a university to suit my lifestyle and then even to fund my own film. Watch this space. I'm going to make my film, see where that takes me. But yeah, of course, I would, of course, want to keep lecturing because even in, in America, at like the New York Film School or different universities, you've got big people teaching particular modules and stuff. I, I, I don't think I could be an artist if I didn't have some kind of job somewhere. Because also for me, just having day-to-day -day experience of working life is so important. And I feed it back into the screenplays that I'm writing. Um, and I feed it back into how I run a film set. So I do think non-artistic work is, value, is very valuable to the artist, really valuable, because it is something outside of the sort of nebulous field of art. It's concrete, Martin. I think it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you this afternoon. Marcus, we and... talked for hours, you and me. <laughs> when you came up, that was so interesting, though, wasn't it? That when you came to Bury and, you know, you, you, you had to get the tram because you got the train to, I think, Manchester Piccadilly and then a tram to Bury and then I met you over the, across the road. As soon as we saw each other, it was like, you know, it was like a, not a love story, but it was like a, a bromance. <laughs> It was actually, I loved it. Martin, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'm going to draw this podcast to a close. Um, you are my debut. You are my debut podcast for this series that I'm, I'm doing. Have you got any advice for me? I just think that keep it to people that, that you have that good connection with. That would be my advice to you to kind of make it that personal feel and it, and it just be a conversation, you know. Martin, thank you so much. I really do wish you the very best of luck uh, as, a, as a great teacher and as a future great filmmaker, we will look out for you. Thank you, Marcus. Take care. <laughs>